audio recording. Yep. And let me just set the. Uh... Oh, and uh, am I correct? No, my pronunciation, Tim Wong. Yeah, that works. Yeah. Close, as close as a white person's going to get. <laughs> Uh, all right, and Mike is here, and quality, high or maximum? I guess we'll go with maximum. <laughs> yeah, what are we we're not here to fuck around? Yeah, seriously, this is the only two <laughs> settings that QuickTime gives you. Uh, all right, so... QuickTime doesn't know how to medium or low yeah. quality. We exactly. only... Mixer and maximum, okay. Uh, okay, I think we're good to go. Cool, okay. Uh, Tim Wong, thank you so much for taking the time. I'm very excited to talk to you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I have been excited to talk to you since before I knew who you were. I just there was someone behind a very curious project uh, called the Trade Journal Cooperative that I knew <laughs> someone interesting had to be running. Um, and so that's where we're going to start. But I want to do an opening question, which kind of helps, I think, get a, it's an interesting way to get a feel for somebody, which is just to sure. find out who your heroes are. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um... I think one of my biggest heroes I'll talk about just off the cuff uh, yeah. is this guy, Charles Fort, who uh, is the source of the term Fortian. Um, basically, mm. he was this guy who, uh, I think he was uh, early part of the 20th century, maybe late part of the 19th century, who was really interested in collecting sort of like documented anomalous phenomena. And so he spent <laughs> years in the British library, basically looking through scientific journals, just looking up things like, like reigns of frogs and just like weird celestial phenomena. And he published these compilations of these books that are just kind of like accounts of this stuff. Um, and I guess he's my hero in some ways just because of his sort of like absolute dedication to what is a really kind of like odd mission uh, <laughs> and his kind of curation of this like strange body of information, um, all of which is, I think, like very near and dear to my heart. Yeah, that explains many of the projects that you've undertaken. Um, <laughs> well, as you said, yeah. it's very revealing about people. So Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you're, it's like maximally arcane. Um, sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so the trade journal uh, cooperative mm -hmm. is how I found you. Um, yep. So I think that's the right place to start. And then we will just like bloom like a flower into all of the various other sure. arcane things that, that you great. do. Um, so the trade journal cooperative describes itself as a, a subscription service, which delivers a niche trade journal to your door once a quarter. Um, I've been a subscriber for a few years now um, and have received like one-off trade journals from um I think probably the most memorable one I had was like the haunted houses. Oh yeah. Like, Haunt world, man. That took forever to get, uh, for, for the listeners, it's basically a trade journal dedicated to people who own and operate haunted attractions of various kinds. Yeah. And so there, it's like an amazing journal. That's one of my favorites as well Is like, you have a whole article on like the pros and cons of different kinds of fake blood. And I'm like, it's amazing, you know? So. Yeah. And so like, tell me, tell me where this project started and like sure. how you got into it. And I, I imagine you just have incredible fun running this thing. Yeah. It's such a good time. Um, so the origin of it is actually a number of years ago, my friends, because he knows I'm into weird stuff like this, uh, got me a gift of a trade journal called pasta professional mm. and pasta professional is the trade journal for people in the, the pasta industry. And uh, I was reading it and I was like, this is so funny, you know, because like basically like even the pasta industry has these two articles that everybody does, right? The first article is how is AI going to change the pasta industry? It's like <laughs> blew my mind. And then the second one is, is our millennials killing pasta? Like, do they like fusilli because they're standing low carb and all these sorts of things. And so I was just like, this is like so incredibly fascinating. It's basically like a document from a parallel universe. Um, and so I kind of started to call around being like, okay, what are the trade journals I can get my hands on? And it's sort of funny when you call these places up, they're like, wait, why are you calling us again? And like, they would not sell you like one-off issues. Mm -hmm. And so the origin of the trade journal cooperative was just merely the idea like, okay, if we can get enough people together, I can basically go to Haunt World magazine yeah. and say like, I want to buy hundreds of your back issues, <laughs> just sell them to me. Cause it's like, it's like dead stock to you. Right. Yeah. And so we'll pay you for it. Um, and it sort of grew out from there. And, you know, I sort of like lovingly describe the project sometimes as like National Geographic for capitalism, because it basically <laughs> is these kind of like quarterly explorations of just like these industries. And it just turns out like every industry is just like its own weird, fascinating um, microcosm, if not macrocosm in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, so that, that was that's sort of the origin of the project. Yeah. Oh, my God. The, the like uh, the parallel universe thing is an incredibly, uh, I think, apt description. Like you open up like, you know, show pony yeah <laughs> manager like a thing and you're like wow it's like 
you are, you are seeing this whole cross section of a whole culture and a whole set of people and a whole, like all the terminology is crazy. Yeah. The slang, I think like the, the, the yeah. shop talk, I think is like a really cool part of it as well. Uh, and then the other one is just kind of like, there's sort of this humbleness where I don't know, I've worked kind of in the tech industry for many years. Right. Yeah. And you're like, Oh my God, you know, like Paul Graham, right. Like, <laughs> like yeah. famous, famous guys. But you kind of get the idea that like reading a lot of these trade journals that like, yeah, you can get super famous in a space, even a big influential space like technology. Yeah. And the minute you step outside of it, people were like, Paul fucking who, you yeah. know? And I do think that that is like, actually like also a really interesting part about it is that these microcosms also have like, you know, like they're low, they're, they're old veterans. Right. And mm -hmm. they're like upstart newcomers. And like, but it's just like in the weird context of like the sugar industry or something. So. Yeah. There, there's like a Paul Graham of magicians somewhere, right. Yeah. Like killer essays <laughs> that everybody loves. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly. And I kind of have this like pet theory that like, like a lot of the characters that we're familiar with in the tech industry, they exist in every other industry. Yeah. Like every industry kind of has to invent these people, right? Like they, everybody needs the guru. And so yep. the guru exists no matter what industry you're talking about. Um, and so that's also been, I think, another super fun part of part of the project. Yeah. It's a really cool, uh, it, one of the favorite things I like. I, I feel like I can always get joy out of the realization that the economy is like mind bogglingly huge. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I could just re-realize that over and over and over again. Totally. And every time you like get one of these, it is like, it is definitely re-remembering that. Um, yeah. And, yeah. And yeah. totally like, I mean, forget about it. Some of the, the times, like we, the last journal was in trucking, right? Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, trucking is a huge industry. Like I was just looking yeah. at some of the numbers and it's just like, yeah, but, but it, it's basically a form of infrastructure, right? Like you don't really think mm -hmm. about it because like, it's so common in every day that you're just sort of like, oh, yeah, it's trucking, right? Yeah. Uh, but then you realize, yeah, like you're saying, right? Like that the economy is like so vast and unknowable in some ways. And, you know, this is kind of like a little way of kind of like getting into that or getting your head around it for sure. Yeah. Truck trucking is a super interesting one because I think it's, uh, it's so big. Like truck driver is the number one most common job in like 17 or 21 totally. states or something like that like it's yeah. wild and i do a lot of road trips through the midwest and it's like mm -hmm. truck 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 you 12 hours of driving past trucks yeah. um you forget yeah. like the arteries of america just like running wild the trucks all the time and because i think it's on the verge of totally transforming right yeah. like, i like to think about like you could basically recreate a railroad level of efficiency with like tesla skates with mm -hmm. shipping containers dropped on them on autopilot Trans, like in caravan form slip streaming with each other at a hundred yeah. miles an hour running 24 hours a day totally and like that may be totally reasonable in 10 years 20 years and like will totally transform the whole supply chain of trucking and leave like millions of people with very different employment opportunities yeah um, i think that's for sure yeah and i think yeah. that's kind of one of the really interesting elements of this you know again kind of like being around the internet a lot i think we often kind of forget like that there's stuff that just needs to be moved around. Like oh, yeah, a big part of the economy is just like, <laughs> I got to get this object from point A to point B. Yeah. And like, I think we're a little bit more aware of it now because of COVID, right? Like all mm -hmm. the supply chains are so messed up that we're like suddenly aware of this stuff in a way that we, you know, maybe a few years ago, we're not as aware of. Um, but, but yeah, I think totally like, it, and that's kind of one of the reasons the Trade Journal Cooperative has this kind of obsession, particularly with like physical industries. Yeah. Right? Like we haven't done necessarily like a lot of journals in like marketing as much. Um, Cause at least for me, I think like learning about like, you know, how some of this stuff is built and happens, I think is like really, really interesting. Yeah. Has, has it, this led you into like investments of any sort or are you just kind of like purely like, is this just voyeurism? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think on, on a, I, I would, I would be doing this by myself if I could. Right. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. like I think like the trade journal cooperative now gives me this like very convenient, like, like place to go knock on knocking on doors essentially yeah. right like gives me an excuse to talk to people which is great yeah and it also gives me an excuse to acquire these journals which is like also really helpful mm -hmm. uh, it is sort of interesting though like i think the subscriber base for the trade journal cooperative has ended up being like three groups like one is like just like nerds like me who were like mm -hmm. just like they're just happy to receive this totally like funny thing <laughs> in the mail once a quarter yeah. and the other two i think which have been really fascinating you know one of them is journalists right who are like mm. always looking for angles on new stories right and you know, I think like people were fascinated by like, okay, how is, how is Brexit going to impact, you know, the haunted house industry, right? Like, it's like a whole great way of kind of talking about the stuff that's happening in the economy. Yeah. And then the other one has frankly been, yeah, like hedge funds, investment groups, right. Who I think are using these trade journals as a way of like 
effectively doing research. Mm -hmm. Um, And I am kind of interested more in that. Like I haven't actually done investments on my own in the space, but I do think it is kind of intriguing that like there's basically like a lot of hidden hidden in plain sight knowledge Mm -hmm. that investors find super valuable in these journals. Um, Because it's not the kind of thing where like, you know, like there's no influencer online tweeting about like the finer points of the pasta supply chain, (laughs) but there's probably money to be made there. Right. Um, And so I've been kind of thinking about like, is there, you know, is there like an investor specific version of this service, Mm. uh, which goes a lot deeper and is like a lot more high touch in some ways, but you know, today, no, to answer your original question, I haven't, I haven't made any investments based on, (laughs) based on the trade journal cooperative. Yeah, that is pretty interesting. I think there's like a, um, I, I, what I appreciate about it is the, I, I think you were kind of dancing around it, is, is the randomness that it like inflicts on me. Like I know, I don't know what you're going to send <laughs> me, but I know that once a quarter, I'm just going to like have something hit my face that's completely new. And I'll be learning about like, you know, open air fish markets, you know, and the economics behind them or the supply chain of salmon or something. And it's very actually harder and harder to engineer that randomness like it's just all algorithmically driven like i don't know how else to ensure aside from like you know outsourcing curation to somebody that i'll encounter something like truly novel totally yeah you know that's outside the echo chamber that's right yeah i was joking with a friend recently i was like my real job is i'm i'm a trade journal sommelier you know like based (laughs) on the tastes of my subscribers i like try to present you something you know interesting you know once a quarter and I think that's right. I mean, and and I think it does actually speak volumes about kind of like the current media landscape in some ways, right? Mm-hmm. Like I think if you were around the internet in the early 2000s, you're like, wow, the internet's like this vast, unknowable place where like all sorts of weird things are happening all the time. And I, I talking to a lot of friends now, I think they have a similar feeling that you do, which is like, oh yeah, I'm just kind of in this weird algorithmic bubble. And like, yeah. I see just like a lot of the same stuff on the internet. Uh, and so it is kind of an interesting irony that like what we what we wanted out of the internet, we now sometimes get through like, like weirdo random services like trade journal cooperative right which is like not internet at all like i literally sit in my living room and i stuff envelopes <laughs> and i mail them to people but i think a lot of people get the the same kind of thrill that you do right which is like yeah. oh yeah like the world is really vast and unknowable it's useful to have that reminder and yeah. hey while i'm here maybe i learned something you know so, yeah 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 it's it is it is wonderful do you encounter like how much curation goes into it like how many journals do you look at and you're like this one's shitty my subscribers uh you know deserve better <laughs> like uh <laughs> Well, yeah, it's kind of funny because like, so trade journals by and large don't, they aren't like, hey, if you want to buy a couple hundred back issues, just call us and get it, right? Yeah. So I think as I mentioned uh, two trade journals ago in the memo, um, like often the task of this is like, you literally go on the website of the trade journal, you find the phone number of the editor in chief, you cold call them and you're like, you don't know me, but I just, I really got to do this thing. Like, hear me out, hear me out, you know? <laughs> and it's it's actually kind of hard because some people are like, what? No, like, or like they're super weirded out by it. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I would say like the first phase of every quarter is just like a mad dash where like I call 30 to 50 different trade journals trying to get a call back. And then like, and then if I'm lucky on a given month, like I'll be like, oh, okay, we have four or five to choose from, which are the better ones or which are the worst ones, right? Oh, and like, for okay. example, for trucking, I actually did a fair amount of research on the trucking one, right? Because it turns out that like we could do multiple years worth of Mm -hmm. uh, trucking trade journals and never repeat the same trade journal. Like it's a huge space and like, and there's different brands in the space, right? Like there's like the young hot brand. There's like the, the, the kind of like up and coming manager brand. And so, so yeah, that there, there's kind of like a little bit more like what will subscribers find interesting essentially. Okay. Uh, yeah, that, but it's a weird kind of career curation because it's just like I, I it's not like I'm collecting any data about anyone who's subscribing. So it's just like if I were the kind of person who would subscribe <laughs> to this, like what would I find cool? I, luckily, Eric, I guess I mean it sounds like you you have enjoyed it, which is great. So. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, yeah, I'm in at least two of those buckets that you described. Um, <laughs> but like in Tim, we trust. Like I, Somalia <laughs> is an excellent. It's like just yeah. Give me a 94 trade journal, like yeah, exactly. Whatever you recommend, vintage, yeah. you know, yeah, exactly. Yeah, whatever. I mean, goes some with of those vintage me. ones are awesome as well. Like um, Elevator World, which is one of the first ones that we did, which is for people in the they actually don't. It's the, the vertical transportation industry is what they call themselves. Oh, and yes. they had like a bunch of back issues, uh, and I actually want to go back and maybe see like could, could I get like a lot of ones from like the 80s. Because I think people would just like, I, I don't know, I'd find that super interesting. So That is so fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> the vertical transportation industry. Yeah. We're horizontally sure. integrating in the vertical transportation yes. industry. Yes. <laughs> like, sure. <Yeah>. Right. <laughs>
Yeah, I'm sure they crack that joke all the time at the annual conference, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Just I'm imagining like a lot of pleats and and a lot of, you know, um, actually probably like extremely meticulous people. <laughs> like I want I want my I want those like Germans like yeah, German yeah. elevator companies. Well, and yeah, German engine. Uh, what is it? I forget that there's a couple companies that really dominate that are all like German engineering uh, yeah. outfits. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't. I don't want the British. The, the, I don't want a lift company. I want a German uh, <laughs> yeah. elevator on something. A true like vertical that. transportation yes. solutions operation. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. Um, okay. All right. So Tim, let's do like uh, the man behind uh, the the co-op. Um, so like by, by day according to your LinkedIn, like where respectable people mm. on a respectable face, you are a <laughs> lawyer and general counsel at Substack. Yep. Um, and you went to Harvard for undergrad. Where, what did you, what was your concentration? Oh, I was a uh, government and econ. Okay. Um, yeah. Which is like then, political science, basically. Yeah. But, just have to come up with a different name for it. Um, you did some engineering, some software engineering too, right? I did. Yeah. Yeah. I actually went okay. to school wanting to do software engineering, but like, I, yeah, I just like the grind of doing it in undergrad. I was like, ah, not worth it. Uh, <laughs> but after college, I did do software engineering professionally for a little bit, but uh, just kind of got pulled in a bunch of other different directions. Okay. Um, yeah. And then <laughs> your website says you secretly went to Berkeley law. Uh, oh yeah. Uh, secretly from who? Well, from everybody uh, <laughs> basically. <laughs> I, so this is kind of an awkward story, but I'm happy to tell it because uh, it's sort of funny. It's a perfect uh, so, preface. Bring it on. Uh, yeah, I uh, basically uh, before law school spent the summer out in San Francisco, loved it, um, and basically moved back there for law school. Went to Berkeley, yeah. and you know, as you may hear, like law school is pretty expensive, right? Um, and so I was like, okay, while I'm in school, I want to just kind of like do some freelance work on the side um, to just kind of defray some of the expenses here because it's like super expensive. Um, but then I rapidly found out that basically no one wants to hire you to do freelance work if they think you're also going to law school, because law school has a reputation for being all consuming. Yeah. Right? And so for my first few freelance projects, I just sort of like didn't mention that I went to law school. Um, and this kind of became like a snowball that rolled down a hill for the subsequent three years where like, I just didn't tell anyone. I made new friends and didn't tell them because it would be sort of weird at that point. And it just like became this big awkward thing. So when I graduated, I was like, Guys, I have a lot of degree now. Uh, and so it's just kind of this like weird, I didn't intend for it to be secret, but it kind of came out that way. So. <laughs> That's amazing. I was like, yeah, secret from like, did Berkeley know? Like somebody had to know. You know? Oh yeah. I mean, my like, I think my, my family knew my yeah. like, uh, you know, my partner, now wife, you know, like knew. So, so like people yeah. knew, but like, I think I was not like, I was like, talking about law school all the time on Twitter or whatever. So, yeah. That's, yeah. that's interesting. Did you find that it was all consuming? No, no, I actually, uh, I, I actually give this advice to a lot of people who are thinking about law school, which is like, there's a lot of stuff in law school that like tricks you into thinking that it needs to be kind of all consuming. Mm. Um, and like, there's basically a lot that's in law school, which is effectively just kind of like a waste of your time. Um, and so, yeah, no, I don't know. I don't, I don't think so. It doesn't need to be, maybe that's the right answer. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, so you have like this totally normal career as like a person who studied political science and then did some engineering and then mm -hmm. did... Uh, is it, what was the transition between software engineering, uh, and then you did a bunch of really interesting, like policy AI stuff, um, yeah. for a few years. So like, th this is what I mean of like, you, you were just absolutely all over the place in the best way possible. <laughs> I mean, um, I, I think my parents still want me to get a real job at some point, but <laughs> no, please. Like I will sign the, the, like keep Tim the weird petition. petition. Yeah. Like <laughs> This is no, like you seriously, like the setup is like by day, you have a normal career by night. You are the most interesting man on the internet. And <laughs> there is an, an endless amount of questions to ask you about these like weird and hilarious projects that you have been up to. Um, and I want to get through as many of them as we can. Sure. Happy to talk um, about them. Yeah. So, okay. So the first one is probably the most normal, uh, Rosen, Wolf and Wong lawyers yep. for the extremely online <laughs> a boutique yeah. law practice that specializes in serving the unique needs of independent creators and small to mid-sized technology businesses yeah i think that's that's right yeah so yeah. so the origin of the firm basically again this is kind of like after law school right mm -hmm. i was basically like okay so what what now right um, my original idea for going to law school was that i really want to start a company that like essentially automated a lot of what lawyers did Mm -hmm. um, but it turns out that as an industry, that's like very, like a very tall wall to climb. Um, and so, um, me and my buddy, Mike Wolf, who had just graduated law school around the same time, were like, yeah, let's just start 
offering legal services on the side. Yeah. Um, and that basically kind of grew into a, a pretty cool sort of like law practice over the years. Um, yeah where we represented like all sorts of people doing kind of interesting things, but largely kind of like people involved in various kind of creative projects being sort of like targeted by, you know, like nasty lawyers essentially. Um, and uh, yeah, so I've taken a backseat to that while I'm working at Substack, but yep. um, you know, it was kind of like a practice that we had been running. Yeah. Is, is that, um, was that an outgrowth or a separate track from the other uh, incredible law firm of Robot, Robot and Wong? Yeah, so that was actually like that. That was the original notion of kind of creating like a law firm that was like fully, fully automated. Um, it was, it was, wasn't bad. I did a little bit of contract work after law school in that space, and I do still think there's like a lot of exciting things to be done there. Um, but yeah, this is separate, separate track for sure. You, you are, you are, inc- you have a black belt at naming things. <laughs> oh yeah, amazing. <laughs> I mean, you gotta have a good name. You know, so. <laughs> it's great, a great branding. Um, have, have you watched like the the other sort of legal automation space? Like, uh, what happened with? I think it was Atrium. Is that Justin Collins? Yeah, company? totally. And some of the other like. Yeah, um, there's, there's a bunch. It's actually like from an industry standpoint, I think it's like it's both business interesting and like technically interesting as well, mm-hmm. right? On the business side, it's this very tricky thing where basically lawyers bill hourly, right? And so they have these like incredible disincentives to become super, super efficient. Yeah. And that creates all sorts of problems in terms of like your sales pipeline, right? Which is like, where do you sell all these cool technology products that you build? And like, how do you frame it up in a way that lawyers would actually adopt, right? So there's yeah. like a whole set of problems there. There's a whole nother set of problems, which are like the technical problems, which I think are also really interesting, right? Which is like, okay, contract automation. Mm-hmm. Can you use NLP to understand what a contract is about? And then can you operate on it programmatically, right? To like, you know, say check for risky, you know, issues. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and yeah. And so I have watched the space for a while and know a couple of people who are doing companies in the space. Yeah. It's, it's really hard. I mean, I think some people have tried to do like lawyer marketplaces. Those have kind of not been so great. I think the ones mm-hmm. that I'm really excited about. So my buddy, uh, Jason runs a company called ironclad, uh, in mm-hmm. the space, which is essentially doing contract automation. But what's interesting is where they started was just like making like the data structured essentially. Mm. Um, and so I think there are people who are like really winning in the space, but, um, you know, this is not like running a social media platform where you hope for like, you know, a hundred thousand X growth, you know, in, in, you know, a short period of time. Yeah. I have seen some that are also in the, um, like arbitration and like settlement prediction space, like yeah. they, they analyze the caseload and the case history and, sort of like give you a risk factor and a decision factor is like totally, from an investment yeah. perspective. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's actually like, it's an interesting space. It's, it feels like a little icky to me, but I think intellectually it's like fascinating, right? Because you yeah. can do like effectively the laws have been loosened now. So you can take a stake in a lawsuit. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. There's they're, they're like financial instruments for these things. Now. Exactly. Right. Right. Yeah. And like, which kind of like blows my mind. Cause then you're like, okay, well we can do all the normal set of financial instrumentation on top of it. Right. Like yeah. let's just tranche a hundred thousand personal injury lawsuits. Right. Uh, and then like, I don't know, at some point you're going to end up with like a subprime, you know, crisis <laughs> or something <laughs> like that. But uh, yeah. So I, that space is like really, really interesting. I think it's also like incredibly dangerous. You're like literally mixing these two really volatile things, but yeah. I, I, yeah, there are people working in the space and I do think it's like, it's pretty interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it is prone to um, prone to abuse perhaps. Like I, I don't think you want people running expected value calculations on personal injury lawsuits and <laughs> like that's. Yeah, that's right. And of course, I mean, they would argue the other side of it, which I can kind of see, right. Which is sure. basically like, well, look, lots of people don't have the money to bring a lawsuit, right? So to yeah. create parity in the legal system, we actually do have to do this funding. So I don't know, cuts, I don't know. I don't know if it's clear that I haven't made up my mind about it. It's like just <laughs> like a very confusing space. Yeah, that's that's okay. You don't, you know, I yeah, feel like, yeah. you know, we're, we're allowed to see nuance on this podcast. This is, totally. this is well, a place of, that. this is a place of it's nuance a and uh, for nuance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it, we can say, I don't know a lot. Um, yeah, exactly. And I do think, I mean, yeah, I, but I final gloss on that space. Like I am still waiting for someone to do like the lawsuit DAO essentially. Mm. Yeah. I did see, um, I saw a DAO. I, I, I don't know if it was a DAO actually, um, some web three native thing that was like, uh, mediation sort of like automated mediation it was like it's supposed mm-hmm. to be um maybe mediation as a service or settlement as a service where it's okay, kind of like yeah. a human layer that can be 
driven sort of like on call on demand mm. participants are rewarded you know juries are like given tokens for their participation the amount of time oh, that they participate <laughs> in the decisions that they contribute to yeah yeah um it's kind of like yeah well, of course there's going to be like disputes that require human intervention around smart contracts and like how do yeah. we build some component in the system that like addresses that without the whole thing coming to a screeching halt you know yeah right right yeah absolutely uh, uh, i thought that was a really interesting one um and there's another thread to go down there um but I can't remember it right now. That's okay. <laughs> um, we can move on to the next like large bucket of interestingness sure. that you do, which I have just recently learned. Thanks to you. A word, uh, is it 40 in? This is the 40 in bucket. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I, I had previously referred to it as scholarly papers about absurd cultural phenomena, which you have a few <laughs> projects that fit into this bucket. Um, you have curated scholarly papers about photos of Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, yeah. So that's actually a journal. It's not just a series of papers. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, so the California Review of Images and Mark Zuckerberg uh, okay. is an academic journal. So like, yes. I'm not the only one publishing. Okay. Uh, and it's attempt to kind of create an academic field focused on not just Mark Zuckerberg, but like imagery in which he appears. Mm. Uh, because I think unlike a lot of uh, like major tech industry leaders, uh, he seems to have been exceptionally good at like ending up in these incredibly strange, <laughs> awkward images. Um, and I feel like that's just like so intriguing to me, right? Is like, why is that? Why are they so strange? What does it tell us about the media? And so we've done we've done two volumes of the uh, California Review of Images and Mark Zuckerberg. And you know, I have a lot of I have a lot of interest in doing a, a third volume, which I think would be really fascinating. Uh, one funny outcome of it, though, is that like I'm now. I, I get calls from journalists looking for comment every time one of these funny images appears. Yeah. Um, and so it has become like, I'm, I'm really working on trying to turn this into a field, you know, like that the, the field of Zuckerberg studies should yeah. really grow over time. Um, and so that's, that's kind of that project. I, I can't wait till you are, show up as an expert witness in a, some sort of, you know, a Zuckerbergologist. Yeah. Uh, yeah exactly. Like <laughs> I, I, I truly don't know which is this is seems like a, a position i find myself in often when i'm like in the with really really smart people and i just can't tell what you're doing that's totally serious and what you're doing that's totally <laughs> a joke and dry uh -huh. and I, I i just love how confused i get and that, that <laughs> like the ability to sit perfectly on that fence of like very serious and very whimsical and that no one can tell the difference is absolutely <laughs> chef's kiss. I appreciate um, that. Yeah. Oh, and I think, I don't know. Again, I think like it is funny. I think it's also genuinely really interesting. It's both. I, yeah, right? I, 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 totally, I, totally, like, I totally agree. Yeah. Um, it's like, yeah, you're like, oh, that's, that's a funny idea. And then you look at some of these that like, oh, there was one I was, I was reading this morning, like uh, Tamara Shepard wrote Neo, uh, neo-colonial intimacies, and mm -hmm. I think, I believe your subtitle, which is editorializing is like about the geopolitics of an awkward hug. Yeah, like that's Mark, right. Mark Zuckerberg, just like a very awkward, like bro hug of uh -huh. world, various world leaders. And yeah, you're like, right. there is actually something really interesting in there. Hey, what's going on here? Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> like, why are but you I so think, like, I don't know. I, really, I do genuinely believe that like, so there's the people of these like tech leaders, right? Yeah. Like there's the person of Elon Musk, right? And then, then there is like, the media phenomena of which he represents. Yeah. And like, I think those two are actually like quite distinct things. And I think we can actually think about like the latter as its own kind of independent thing. Like Elon mm -hmm. Musk could be like someone totally different from his public persona, but like his public persona really matters in that, like it clearly hits a chord and it clearly says something about culture. Right. And so yeah. I think it is actually worth investigating. Like, what do these symbols mean? Right. Um, you know, in the same way that you think about like, what does a celebrity mean, right? Or what is a what does a really popular movie say about culture? Yeah, it, it, we create a shared narrative around a, a fictional person that may or may not is inspired by a real person that may or may not represent the real person. Um, yeah, exactly, yeah. right. And in some ways, that like those representations become like bigger than the person yeah. themselves, right? Like, that, oh, and that's yeah, kind way of bigger. The, yeah. One of the most yeah, one of the most fascinating things about Zuck is that you often get the feeling that he's like sort of like subject to it you know he's like not fully in control oh, of yeah. like his like media you know universe uh which which i think is really interesting because I, I think we have a lot of ceos that are a lot more like everything is very curated right like the kind of like tim cook universe where it's just like you know everything is just like staged in a certain way 
Yeah. Well, if you look at like, I was thinking, I was comparing uh, Zuckerberg to Elon Musk. I was watching mm -hmm. that like metaverse presentation. I was like, sure. why is he so much weirder and more awkward to watch than like Elon? Like they're both Elon Musk and Zuckerberg are both like su super nerds and not like, <laughs> not like char uniquely charismatic, not polished, not well uh -huh. presented, but like yeah, Zuckerberg yeah. is trying so hard to like be that smooth, the charismatic, well presented like Tim mm -hmm. Cook, and he just can't do it. And if he would just be <laughs> Be weird and himself like Elon Musk is. That would be the advice. It yeah. would be so much better. It'd be so much better. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's kind of like a lot of people have written about that in the in the review. Okay. It's just like <laughs> that the sort of like snake eats its own tail, right? Where it's just like yeah. this attempt at normalcy creates this like incredible uncanny. <laughs> yeah, like, it's, a, persona, it's uncanny right? valley. It's a, he's a person. He's a real person in the yeah. uncanny valley, and it's terribly awkward. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so um, it's, uh, it's interesting. Okay, and you have similar. Uh, I, I'm not sure if they're papers or journals uh, mm. about the Venture Brothers cartoons and the Adventure Time cartoons. Yeah, and so the right, like the the in some ways the California Review of Mark Zuckerberg kind of comes out of this kind of like series of projects. Where mm -hmm. the first one I did was my with my friend Darby Smith. Um, we we're just basically like Adventure Time. It's an incredible show, and there's like a lot of really super interesting things to write about it. Mm -hmm. Like, what would happen if we got a bunch of people to like think about it, right? Like, and do yeah. like a proper collection of essays. Um, and it was like really fun to do, really successful. And it just turns out there's like a lot of people who really want to put a lot of brain energy into talking about this stuff. Yes. And so I was like, wow, okay. Like the cost of activation to creating your own academic journal is like incredibly low, way lower than I ever thought it would be. Right. <laughs> and so you now have this like template where you can be like, let's just have a journal about that and a journal about that <laughs> and a journal. And so like after the, after adventure time, I was like, oh, I've been watching a lot of venture brothers where it was just, like a funny and absurd show. And we we're like, okay, let's do a journal on that. And then a few years later, I was like, oh yeah, this Mark Zuckerberg thing. I was at this bar comparing like like a bunch of saved photos of Mark Zuckerberg I had with a friend of mine. And I was like, <laughs> we should do an academic journal about this. And this is kind of like how that came to be. Well, yeah, I have a template to spin up projects like this. That's that's good. Yeah, um, exactly. And if you see in the website, it's just like me doing my own terrible HTML. There's like nothing yeah. fancy to it at all. Uh, but I don't. People seem to find it interesting. So again, I'm happy to do it. This is kind of the same feeling I had when uh, I, I realized for the first time that like big fancy like institutes and think tanks mm -hmm. are are just like oh you that's just like one or two like nerds that are paid <laughs> to think about a thing. You're like, like you're just a bunch of guys. It's like I yeah I'm here on behalf of the you know AI comp contemplation institute. Yeah, and I'm sure. like what is that? And like five times you ask what is that it turns out it's like that guy writing papers that totally, somebody paid yeah. him to do and you're yeah. like oh like oh okay 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 but like yeah. i know I do have this idea that like um you know like if you looked back in the 20th century like all of the markers of institutional importance were like kind of expensive to get mm -hmm. right like mm -hmm. you like get the brass plaque and like the diploma you know like yeah but like the cost of all of that stuff has just gotten cheaper and cheaper and cheaper now that like anyone could create any institution they want in some ways, right? Because it's like so low cost to achieve like a minimal viable level of credibility yeah. that like, why not, right? Yeah. Like you can spin up these institutes and, you know, dissolve these institutes. It's kind of just very <laughs> fluid in that way. So. Yeah, which, and then it sets it up for these perfect, like uh, semi-serious tongue in cheek institutes that uh, yeah. are, yeah, that will become your legacy if I have anything to say about totally. it. <laughs> and as yet, like, yeah, exactly. Like, I don't know, as a believer in like many absurd jokes becoming like really serious changes of history over time, <laughs> you're kind of just like, yeah, it's like launch a bunch of these things and kind of see what happens. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you also uh, like, I would be remiss if that's your only legacy because you also do a lot of actually like really serious, important work, um, probably especially around AI. Uh, I know that's not probably your focus now because you're um, general counsel at, at Substack. But yeah, I know but you... happy to talk about it. I still keep an eye on the space pretty closely okay. and all that. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I, I'd love to because I think, um, I don't know, do you have a sense of like what their, what the most high impact technology will be over the next decade? I mean, that's a super tough bet, right? Like uh, super, super tough. Yeah. I yeah, mean, it's a very yeah. thumb in the air kind of thing, but yeah, um, yeah. I'm I, almost like, kind of totally go ahead. I uh, just think like you're, you are, I'm curious if the answer is AI to someone who is really close to that space, or if you feel like it's still kind of in the perpetual horizon mode. I think it's in a perpetual horizon mode. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think it'll be important, but I think it will play the role of like, a supporting character, right? In like mm -hmm. the pantheon of technologies that become super important okay. uh, rather than being the thing itself, right? So like, I think like when, you know, DeepMind cracked Go and all this stuff, 
right? People were like, oh God, yeah. Like we're like, going to build, here. we're going yeah. to build the AGI and then it's going to become the technology that does everything else. Right. Yep. And, you know, I think what's become clear is that like, and I think a lot of people even pointed it out at the time, right. Which is like, we have like a significant advancement in the technology, but it is not necessarily going to become like the core technology in of itself. Right. And so what I mean by that is, you know, like, look, we're going to use machine learning to help aid and accelerate drug discovery. Mm -hmm. Right. And the core technology there is going to be drug discovery, right. Not right. necessarily AI. And so I kind of feel like that's, that's kind of how I size it up now. Mm -hmm. Like, again, to our, our earlier discussion, right? Like, I do think that, like, you know, big corporate battles and even national battles will be fought over AI. Mm -hmm. uh, but but if, to your question of just, like, what's going to be the most significant technology? Like, I guess I'm I'm a little bit more bearish on on sort of AI writ large. Okay. Um, so you're not in the the kind of, like, Eliezer Yudkowsky camp where you're, like, AI alignment is the most important problem facing humanity and, like, it's not even close. Yeah, that, I don't I don't think so, Yeah. Okay. I mean, it, to my mind, I'm, I guess, a little bit more apocalyptic. I'm like, do we even, does society <laughs> survive to the point where we get to confront that question? I think is more where we're at, right? Like maybe it's the, maybe it would be the most important technology if we had solved a bunch of other really pressing stuff that we got to deal with. So what's, what's on that list for you? Uh, I mean, I do think stuff like climate change is huge. I do yep. think like societal inequality is like an enormous problem, right? Like I do think yep. that like, there's all these kinds of issues that like, just strike at like a much lower level of the Maslow's hierarchy. Yeah. Uh, like we kind of got to get fixed up, I think, uh, before we talk about like, is alignment the most critical problem? Okay. Interesting. Um, so what does, uh, you, you wrote a paper uh, mm. in 2019 that I intend to read because it looks very interesting. Maneuver and manipulation on the military strategy of online oh, yeah, information yeah. warfare. Um, yeah, is, yeah. Did, did that have to do with um, AI or was that just kind of like, happened to be uh, a similar yeah. thing. And this is more about the media piece. Totally, yeah. So this is actually kind of a separate thread of work. Okay. Um, so basically about over a decade now, wow, it's wild. Um, uh, over a decade ago, basically me and a couple of collaborators were like part of the group that demonstrated that you could use bots to sort of shape discussion online. Mm. So at the time, like I just graduated college and we we're basically like, we we're running these competitions that we, we, we thought of as basically like battle bots, but social. So the idea was that people would write bots to go on Twitter and mm -hmm. you would win points based on how many reactions you could get, right? And we just do a race, right? Which is like over a month, like which bot is able to generate the most sexual engagement. And, you know, what was scary at the time was basically like, oh yeah, these like really simple scripts can generate like really powerful social interactions in people. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it might amuse you. I've told this anecdote a couple of times before, but it's worth reiterating here in light of what happened next was basically like, you know, at the time we were like, oh, this is awesome, right? Like, what if you could use bots to help people communicate across polarized, you know, political boundaries, right? Or yeah. what if you could use bots to kind of fight disinformation on the internet, right? Yeah. Um, and so obviously like in the next decade, that didn't happen at all, right? No, so quite like the opposite. Sort of tracing, <laughs> to, quite the opposite, like totally the opposite, 180 yeah. like degrees in the, the other direction. And, uh, and so I ended up, you know, basically over the last decade, you know, kind of like watching this space and thinking a little bit about like, okay, you know, if this technology is going to be used to sort of like manipulate the public sphere, then like, what is, what is our strategy, right? Like, how do mm -hmm. we combat this stuff, right? Like, you know, if we're worried about Russians manipulating an election, right? Like, how do you actually go about, you know, creating a strategy to deal with this stuff? And, you know, there's basically this like line of literature that was written during the Cold War about information warfare, mm -hmm. which is like very hand wavy. It's basically like, how do we fight communism? Well, we need inspiring messages about democracy. And you're like, I can't, I don't know what you're supposed to do with that. Um, and part of the thesis of the paper though, is that basically like, because social activity is a lot more data-driven than it used to be, right? Like information warfare is also potentially a lot more data-driven than it used to mm -hmm. be as well. And it kind of talks about sort of like the implications of that. Interesting. So, um, yeah, what is the modern Rocky for? Like, you know, how do, how do you <laughs> combat communism with, um, so, so your, your thesis in that paper was, was like data-driven responses and reactions. Like, do, do you think that like, it's the responsibility of the social media platforms to like police and remove bots, or is this about yeah, sort of so, uh, counter counteractive bots that like attack the same way or defend the same way they're being attacked? Totally. So I think there's two answers to that question. So the first one is basically like, you have a question about sort of like solutions, right? So mm -hmm. like, what are you supposed to do here? And I'm really intrigued by the notion of like robust, what you call like sort of robust social topologies. 
-hmm. So the way to think about this basically is like, okay, imagine everybody in society. Now imagine all of the relationships between them mapped, right? Mm -hmm. And now imagine for a moment that you could color code which one of these people, uh, which which people are like just more inherently skeptical than others, right? Mm -hmm. And I think what you find is that like the, the distribution of skeptical people in society is like unevenly distributed, right? Oh, yeah. And that actually creates certain interesting things about like where in society may be vulnerable to disinformation campaigns, right? Mm. Which is okay. Maybe I target places where there actually aren't this like large group of skeptics, right? Interesting. But yeah. if you, you could imagine for a moment that you could take these skeptics and move them around and sort of like rewire the set of relationships in society, we could create sort of a topology that says, if you were trying to influence any one person, you are never further than two links away from someone who's just like a huge tool, like an enormous skeptic about everything. Right? <laughs> and like, that might be actually a way to think about like what societies are like more robust against these attacks than others, right? Which is like, what are the kinds of configurations or relationships between people that mm -hmm. are like inherently just a lot more robust against manipulation, essentially. So that's yeah. kind of like the first block, right? Yeah. And you had a second part of your question, which is like, yeah, you had a second part of your question, which is like, okay, so who's responsible for this? Yeah. Um, and the paper also talks about that a little bit as well, because yeah. the problem is basically the problem, quote unquote, in liberal democracies is that you can't necessarily be like, okay, you know what we're going to do? We're going to just have the government have this ministry of truth and it will evaluate yeah. <laughs> every tweet and then it'll tell you what's good or not. Like, so the problem with civil, like liberal democracy is that like you want civil society to be mostly like responsible for the defense against these things, right? You like yeah, want yeah. like journalists and nonprofits and all the stuff to actually be the ones who fight this war. Yeah. And so the, the interesting thing for me is like, basically and I talk about in the paper is like the challenge is like, where do you draw the red line, right? Mm -hmm. We're like, when does an influence campaign become so pervasive and so dangerous that you want the government set, stepping in? But it feels like part of the policy development here is to like draw that line, right? And have that be yeah. a clear set of lines. Um, which uh, like is being worked on here and there, but I think is like a big part of the intellectual work in the space. Yeah, that is that is very interesting. So you got like there's the the Ministry of Truth government solution, and then there's kind of the like platform uh, sort of reaction solution, and then there's the fully decentralized sort of organic solution that is like people just being filtering the truth for themselves. Yeah, and, then, and I think it's kind yeah. of like it's almost like. I mean, again, like using everything as a COVID metaphor right now, but like you like using like a vaccine metaphor, right? Which is yeah. like, okay, what's the level of infection that actually helps like decentralized like society get stronger at dealing with this stuff? Yeah. At what point is that virus so big that we then want the platforms to step in, mm -hmm. right? And also because it builds resilience for those platforms, right? And then like, right. what's the point at which it gets even bigger than that, that we actually want like the government to step in. But in each case, you're basically trying to say like, what's like a like what's the what's the maximal level of danger yeah. that we want because we think like low level manipulation is probably like a good thing to build up the robustness of society right and so it's kind of like you're like oh allowing like a certain background level of this to occur essentially um, yeah. because you feel like it builds like a stronger polity effectively yeah i mean i actually think it, i i've been thinking about this a little bit because i think it's actually I think it would be dangerous sort of monoculture for all of humanity to ever believe like one thing super deeply, right? Like right. from an evolutionary perspective, if you just wanted to like some guarantee of species survival, you always want some sort of dissenting group mm -hmm. to be like opting into their own trial with conviction of, you know, whatever sort sure. of the minority behavior is. Um, even though it's socially unpopular and that's, you know, the, the skeptics that you're, that you're talking about. I think that's really interesting. That's right. Yeah. And I think it is kind of like, you know, and this is part of the challenge. I think that like a lot of tech people deal with, but I think it's just part of our discourse around free expression is like, you know, like, okay, so we have a marketplace of ideas. Mm -hmm. Everybody just wants to believe that the marketplace of ideas is like self-regulating over time, <laughs> but like, like yeah. financial markets, they are they are not self-regulating, right? right? And I think we are now kind of like confronting the problem of like, okay, so what's the appropriate level of governance, right? Yeah. I mean, and then that's kind of the interesting challenge that we find ourselves in. Yeah. Okay. So so a few branches off of this kind of really interesting like sure. um, information warfare piece, uh, we we are rapidly running out of time, as I knew we would, because we have a <laughs> long list of exciting things. But um, so bite on any of these if you want, but sure, I think yeah. there's sort of three really interesting sort of um, branches that are projects that you have done on mm -hmm. this theme. So the National Conspiracy Writing Month, um, <laughs> the uh, which is which is like inspired by National Novel Writing Month and is like asking participants to complete a quote, daunting but straightforward challenge to develop a deep, viable and complete conspiracy theory during the 30 days of November. Yeah. Um, 
the Hype Up Weekend, a weekend-long project devoted to launching fake startups and attempting to obtain press coverage, um, which is like clearly a play on Startup Weekend. Yeah. Um, and then a conference which looks much more serious, uh, a conference on the real-world practice of countering online influence operations called COGSEC. Mm -hmm. um, so all of those seem like also on the fence of like perfectly wonderfully nerdy <laughs> and fun and challenging and interesting um, sort of riffs on the information warfare piece. Yeah, totally. Um, well, yeah, let me talk a little bit about NACO-RIMO and COGSEC, because like I said, they sort of come out yeah. of the same place in some yeah. ways, right? Which is, and, and this goes back to the story that I was talking about, right? Which is like, you know, a lot of people who are worried about the influence of bots on social media mm -hmm. have never tried to just like create a bot and like break <laughs> through Twitter's like account verification system. And is there's it, like, a, yeah. Is it as easy as it was like when you were doing this 10 years ago? Like, could you still uh, they're definitely, have done that? They're, yeah, they're definitely better, but you can definitely get through stuff. Okay. <laughs> um, and like, so I, I'm a big believer that like, like a hands-on experience uh, in this space is like incredibly, incredibly valuable, mm -hmm. right? And so the notion of CogSec was exactly that, right? Which is like, we have lots of conferences where people kind of like stroke their beards and they're like, you know, how do we improve media literacy over the next 30 years? And like mm -hmm. my response is again, a little bit like the, the, uh, um, the, the Eliezer response, right. Is basically like, look, like, I don't even know if we're going to have a democracy by that <laughs> point. Like we really got to be solving these problems faster than, than what you guys are talking about. Yeah. And so Cogsec was basically like, let's get people who have like been online, who have been targeted by these campaigns, who have fought these campaigns, just giving seminars about like, here's how you do it. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, and so like we had like, uh, people would give these incredible presentations. Like one was like, here's how I infiltrate white supremacist groups online. And here's how you can do it too. Right. <laughs> and like, just like walking people through, like, here's my OPSEC here's, you know, yeah. and I think that's like, again, so valuable in that, like these like super practical skills is like really where it happens. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and so similarly, like NACO RIMO kind of came out of the same place, which is like, you can think about conspiracy theories, not necessarily as their own little weird exotic thing but essentially just like a really good story. Like it's mm -hmm. basically just fan fiction about reality, <laughs> like really great fan fiction that becomes all consuming, right, essentially. Yeah. And, um, and so like we should be able to learn how to write conspiracy theories like we're learning how to write poetry or a short story mm -hmm. or something like that. It's just like a medium like anything else. Right? Yeah. Um, and so again, the notion of Nako Rimo was like, yeah, what would it mean for us to like actually play with this as a medium? Um, and you know, again, could it tell us something about like, how do we deal with the problems that we have today? Mm -hmm. um, and so again, both of them were kind of like inspired by this idea that like, you know, if we're going to deal with some of these problems, we have to be like very practically minded. And like a lot of the skills we learn have to be like, okay, mm -hmm. if we're worried about conspiracy theories, how do you, how do you build one? Right. Um, yeah. And like, just having like a learned experience of that, I think is probably a lot more valuable than like a million white papers that like various think tanks put out. Yeah. Okay. I, I we could do a whole another hour on this topic. I feel like I, I want to like hear all about your actual practical thoughts about what's truly happening in the trenches of that war. Sometime. Mm -hmm. um, sure. But I. But we're we're running out of time, and I want to do uh, a little bit about your book too, um, which I also had. Oh, sure. Yeah. Had no idea you had written a book until. Um, <laughs> It's, it's still amazing to me that all of this just like kind of like exploded out from me being like, I wonder who's behind this trade journal it's like cooperative. <laughs> um, it's like, I don't know, but he's the most interesting guy ever. Okay. And you just wrote a book called The Subprime Attention Crisis, yeah, which came out year. A, yeah, last year. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, will you, will you like throw out the premise for us? Um, sure. So it's just super, super interesting. And I have never heard this theory even like whispered before, um, mm. which makes it particularly kind of... Uh, I don't know, like you are, you are a true surprise contrarian, like, uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I, it, and, and is this, or is this not a conspiracy theory, your, your submission for NACO RIMO? <laughs> yes. I guess surprise. <laughs> no, I actually, so I totally believe this one, depending okay. on what you think you, you might think about it as a conspiracy theory. Um, so the premise is really simple, basically, uh, that, you know, our everyday experience of the web is shaped by, uh, online advertising. And online advertising is done online in like a very specific way, something that's known as programmatic advertising, which is basically where you have algorithms that are buying and selling attention, you know, at huge scale, right? And this is how Google, Facebook, Twitter, you know, like all of these kind of big companies that have really represented the modern web are, are funded, right? Like on the order of like 90% of their revenue. And does that imply like targeted by demographics too? Yeah, targeted by okay. demographics, ultimately. It's sort of the dream that, like, look, online advertising is, like, better than all forms of advertising because it can mm -hmm. use all this data to, like, target and add to you. Mm -hmm. And 
the book sort of makes the argument that like we have all become convinced that the system really works really well like that like mark zuckerberg for instance like has like a mind control ray like he can go into your brain and be like you're gonna buy this thing yeah and you do right but once you start looking at the data, it's clear that like large segments of this economy are just like garbage, right? Between hmm. ad fraud, the effectiveness of ads, like all of this kind of stuff. And so the book kind of raises the question, right? Which is like, what if the primary funding mechanism for the internet is just like a lot more fragile than it looks? Mm -hmm. And like, what does that actually sort of like mean in practice? Um, and I'm sure some of your listeners will be like, that's like a ridiculous thesis, but I'll give you kind of one anecdote that hopefully will get you interesting enough to read the book. A few years ago, Procter & Gamble, right? One of the most sophisticated, biggest online advertisers in the world. They cut, they cut their online advertising by about $200 million, right? Mm -hmm. And then a, a little while later, they actually reported to the public. They're like, we could identify no change to our bottom line or anything, huh. no change at all resulting from this, this enormous change in our strategy, right? And I think, I don't know, even if you are convinced about the value of the ads, you have to be able to answer the question like, so what's going on there, right? Yeah. And this book is kind of an attempt to answer that. Interesting. And yeah, I mean, I was, I have listened to other podcasts that are like a whole hour dedicated to you talking about this book and kind of debating it, which is really interesting. And I encourage people to go listen to if you want the full kind of exploration of that. I think it's a really interesting uh, the, the, the truism around marketing of like half your budget is wasted, but you don't know which half is like <laughs> yeah. as true d despite the modern tooling as it has ever been. Um, and in your contention here, so you, you, the metaphor you use is the subprime mortgage crisis mm -hmm. to kind of talk about this, implying that there may be some sort of future, uh, collapse or, yeah, that or I kind rapid of see decompression, the rapid That's decrease. Right. In, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I do see it as ultimately, and this is kind of the argument that the, the book makes is that like, it's a bubble, you yeah. know? Um, and, you know, while I think like companies like Google and Facebook may fare pretty well, like everybody else that's kind of reliant on this marketplace, right, is like in a, in a world of hurt. Um, and so, yeah, it's kind of the argument that this is like a lot less stable than it looks um, and that we should be concerned about that. Interesting. Um, so who is, I mean, that's a big ecosystem, right? So who all is affected by it? So certainly like Google and Facebook, the companies offering it. Themselves, yeah. The main advertisers. Um, I mean, how will it affect users, uh, sure. yeah, shareholders? I mean, I that's right. Yeah. Publishers, certainly, right? Like journalism yeah. is by and large kind of funded by this. I think users are super impacted. You think about all the services that are free, largely mm -hmm. because it's like advertising subsidized. I think the final one that you might find interesting, actually, given what we we're talking about earlier is like, you know, a lot of these companies are also doing cutting edge research in various fields like AI. Mm -hmm. Like, and like DeepMind is not a moneymaker for Google, right? Like that oh. should be no surprise. Yeah. And like the only reason it can run at such losses is because of advertising. Yeah. So like, I think like what else is at stake? Like even stuff like basic research, I think. Like R&D on the tech sector is driven a lot by this. Yeah. yeah. Totally. Totally. Interesting. And so, okay. yeah. So I think like, and again, this is sort of like the comparison to the subprime crisis is that like, it's sort of like tentacles are like all over the economy in some ways. And so, you know, I think even if you don't believe it's a bubble, I think it's worth learning about just because like the fluctuations in this like ad industry have like all of these large ramifications. That is super interesting. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I think a lot of people have been like, you know, oh, we're in a bubble. Are we in a bubble? Valuations are high. And, and it, you kind of look around and you're like, but what could the bubble be? Um, mm -hmm. And this is actually one of the first things that I've heard first and certainly most novel sort of theories about like, you know, show me the thing that's going to pop. That's going to mm -hmm. make everybody go like, wait a minute, like the emperor has no clothes. And, and by the way, neither does anybody else. Um, <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So that's really interesting. Okay. So um, w do you have thoughts about like how, um, how this connects to web three? Is this, is that the transition between like web two and three that like the free model driven by ads, we realize it's not, but we have this new technology that lets us kind of, you know, is microtransactions like the solution that you yeah, see to this? Or? Of, right. I sort of have a weird take on this because I, I definitely don't end up being like some people you talk to and their conclusion is like dot, dot, dot. And like everything will be solved by micropayments on the blockchain, you know? <laughs> and like, I, I guess I'm not, I'm not ultimately like a believer in that. I do think that like, and sort of I'll end on this kind of like quick take about w, uh, Web3 is like, I do think that... Um, one of the most interesting things about Web3 is actually not the technology itself in my mind, but instead it's attempt to sort of change like the norms around content, mm -hmm. right? And so like, I actually like, in some ways I'm kind of like, eh, 
blockchain, you know, like I, I could, I could do without that. Right. But essentially <laughs> what you're doing is like, you're changing the psychological price of what people are willing to pay for certain things, mm-hmm. right. Where it doesn't seem absurd for you to pay X number of dollars for like a JPEG on the internet. Yeah. And like, I think that's potentially a really big deal because it does flip a lot of the economics of the web. Um, and you know, the question is whether or not those norms can scale over mm-hmm. time. Right. Because again, I think we've all been trained on the internet, which the psychological price of everything is zero. Right. And, and I think that's like, if, if Web3 is going to make a big difference, it's really more about like pulling off that sleight of hand, which yeah. is like not much is different, but you're just willing to pay for it now. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I do think that is a potential stepping stone to, you know, getting past this bubble, right? To say, okay, can we actually have an internet that's driven on, you know, not just ads, but actually like um, paid subscription ultimately. Yeah, direct transactions. Yeah. yeah. Super, super interesting. Um, if you have time for one more question, uh, I would love to know of any books that you're just like really excited to be talking about right now or recommendations that you make super frequently. And if not, uh, you just hang up on me in the podcast. Over. <laughs> no, happy to do. Uh, yeah, happy to answer that question. Okay. So, uh, so the book I just finished reading is uh, David Graeber's The Dawn of Everything, mm-hmm. which is like super, super fun and interesting. So um, Graeber wrote uh, Debt the First 5,000 Years. He's basically like this kind of like lefty economist guy yeah. who passed away this year, last year. And so this is like final book, essentially. Yeah. And it's a fascinating book. It's basically about the idea that like we have this idea when we talk about societies, which is that like we moved from like these like egalitarian tribal bands. And then like we created civilization, which is like incredibly productive and you know technologically advanced but is also kind of like hierarchical and has like all of these problems, right? And he sort of makes the argument looking in prehistory, which is basically that like, yeah, like actually this this is kind of like a total fairy tale essentially. And he basically is trying to like blow up the idea that like essentially like pre-modern societies had to be organized in a particular fashion. And Mm -hmm. in doing so, trying to make the argument that like we can also reorganize society today, right? Ultimately. Um, And it's a fun book. If you're interested in learning about like kind of like you know, ancient societies and stuff. It's like a super cool read. Cool. Awesome. Appreciate it. I know, I know we're over time. Thank you so much for taking the time that you did and the the bonus time that I stole from you. (laughs) Um, I appreciate it, man. I hope we get to do this again because I seriously could do this uh, all day and um, there's many more rabbit holes to go down, but thank you for the time. This is great. So yeah, keep me posted and um, yeah, happy to step another time. All right. All right. Thanks, Eric. We'll talk soon.